Yeah, you're right, Joe. <laughs> <laughs>
We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, on behalf of the City of Darwin, I welcome you all to the 79th Bombing of Darwin Day Commemorative Service, a National Day of Observance. My name is Scott Waters and I am the Chief Executive Officer for the City of Darwin. I will be your Master of Ceremonies for today's commemoration. On behalf of the City of Darwin, I would like to extend a special welcome to veteran Mervyn I, civilian survivors, evacuees along with descendants who are here today, many who have travelled long distances to be with us. To ensure today's ceremony is not interrupted, can you please take a moment to make sure that all mobile phones have been switched off or turned to silent. City of Darwin acknowledges that we are living and working on Larrakia country. We acknowledge the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the Darwin region. We pay our respects to the Larrakia elders, past and present, and support emerging Larrakia now and into the future. City of Darwin is committed to working together with all Larrakia to care for this land and see for our shared future. So far as the first air raid goes, what we now call the bombing of Darwin, there is much more to this attack than meets the eye. The raid began, so it is said, at 9.58 on Thursday morning. But the more historians have examined the story, the more surprising detail can be found. Early that morning, some 300 kilometres northwest off the Territory coast, the four aircraft carrier battle group of the Imperial Navy turned into the wind and began launching its 188 aircraft. Once formed up, they flew over the ships in their traditional morale-boosting pass. With thousands of crewmen waving good luck from below, then they settled down into their flight. Absolutely straight on the Tiwi Islands made an admirable navigational marker. But flying overhead, the flight leaders spotted a parked transport aircraft on the runway. Nine of the 36 Zero Escort fighters were detached and dived down towards the target. They sprayed it with machine gun and cannon fire and set the transport alight. 
Some of the overspray hit the communications hut of the missionary Father McGrath nearby. He was radioing to warn Darwin. The rest of the Air Armada had continued on, intent on crossing the coast well to the west of Darwin before tracking in a circle for their final run. This approach from the southeast would give them several advantages. They would be attacking out of the sun, they would have the element of surprise, and the bombers would only have to make one run over the target. The nine zeros left their target burning fiercely and hurried to catch up. Realising they could not do this, they cut the corner and flew for Darwin in a straight line. Knowing they should not give the game away, they strafed the ships eight kilometres away tending the boom net, the longest in the world, which stretched across the harbour from East Point. The small vessels there fought fiercely, with one of the ship captains, Lieutenant Muzzle of the HMAS Gunbar, being hit in both knees but remaining at his post. On board HMAS Karakara, leading cook Francis Ems was manning a machine gun. He was seriously wounded but fought on before he collapsed. Later he was evacuated to the hospital ship Menunda but died on the way there. Ems was later awarded a posthumous mention into it should have been a Victoria Cross as should have been the case for Muzzle. A minute after the boom net attack commenced, Darwin was bombed from the high-level Kate three-man machines, which were followed by Val dive bombers. They inflicted enormous destruction, sinking 11 ships, destroying 30 aircraft and killing 236 people. It is indeed Darwin's story of sadness, defiance, bravery and loss, all wrapped up together. But we continue to find out more and more of this tale of the biggest air attack ever carried out against our country. On Bombing of Darwin Day, remember and commemorate those who are part of the war fought over Northern Australia. And so, to today's commemorative service, we will be sounding the air raid siren at 9.58am, the exact time it first sounded on the 19th of February 1942. This will be followed by a reenactment of events of the day. Earplugs have been provided for your use during the ceremony if required. I now ask you to please stand for the arrival of Her Honour, the Administrator of the Northern Territory, Mrs Vicky O'Halloran, and please remain standing for the playing of the musical salute. Thank you. Please be seated. I now take this opportunity to formally acknowledge Her Honour, the Honourable Vicky O'Halloran, Administrator of the Northern Territory, the Honourable Darren Chester, Minister for Veteran Affairs and Defence Personnel representing the Honourable Scott Morrison, Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Michael Gunner, Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, the Honourable Nari Arkit, Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, Mr Luke Gosling, Member for Solomon, representing the Federal Leader of the Opposition, Ministers of the Northern Territory, Mrs Leah Finocchiaro, Leader of the Opposition in the Northern Territory, and our host today, the Right Worshipful, the Lord Mayor of Darwin, the Honourable Convat Scarless, and the Alderman of the City of Darwin. 
Today is a day to reflect on our past and to pay tribute to those servicemen and servicewomen and civilians who were there, those who courageously defended our country, those who selflessly helped others, those who dealt with the aftermath and, of course, those who lost their lives. I now invite Kyriakos Lambrinidis to reflect. Wars, it is said, are often tragic, but in some ways certain instances of combat actions can be sadder than most. I want to talk today on one aspect of the attacks of Darwin 1942, 19th February, that focuses our attention on something sadder than most, the loss of young lives. When the enemy arrived in force, most of the Darwin population had been evacuated, some in circumstances a little stranger than normal. Wendy James, for example, was evacuated in December 1941 at the age of six. If it was today, we would expect she would have been flown down south, but in the early 1940s, movements of large numbers of people was not done by aircraft, but by ship instead. Wendy, together with her mother and sister, went south on a commercial freighter, ironically through waters that even then were starting to be infested with the submarine menace that sent scores of Australian vessels to their end over the next few years. Wendy survived, and we are always glad to see her commemorating such days with us now. Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy in two ways. There is avoidable confusion, the avoidance of which might have seen the two lovers survive. But the other part of the tragedy is their youth. They had so much to live for. So too did the youngest member of the more than 200 who died on that day. Robert Stobo, a deck cadet on the freighter Neptuna, moored down at the main wharf. A deck cadet was a trainee officer, something Robert had wanted to be since he grew up near Sydney Harbour. He had been living his dream. But then a bomb of the first of the high-flying three-man bombers hit his ship and brought its end some 20 minutes later when its cargo of ammunition blew up. Young Robert died, along with 36 of his shipmates. Up on the cliffs above the wharf area, the administrator and his staff had sought shelter in their dugout, which had been installed about 10 metres from the residence. Daisy Martin, a young Aboriginal housemaid of around 18 years, was caught in the blast from another bomb the shrapnel killing her instantly. Just a hundred metres or so from where I stand today, the Darwin Post Office staff were sheltering in their slit trench, good protection from anything but a direct hit. But that was what caught Iris Bold, the 19-year-old daughter of the postmaster. Her father and her mother, Alice, also part of the staff, died with her. These three young people and many more in the flower of their youth died in that first raid. Robert, Daisy, and Iris are buried at the Adelaide River War Cemetery, but many other victims of the raid knew only the sea for their grave. All deaths in war are tragic, but we often find the deaths of young people even more so, for they had all their lives before them and could have realized so much more happiness. Thousands more were to die on Australian soil as the air war, air war raged across the north of the continent, from Townsville and Queensland, down the east coast, and to our west along the coast, down nearly as far as Perth. We remember all those who died every year, and we will continue to ensure their memories live on every time we gather on this occasion. Lest we forget, thank you. Thank you, Kyriakos. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, Shalom Kar, accompanied by the band of the 1st Brigade, will now perform My Country. Yeah. 
beauty, her beauty and her terror, the wine brown land for me. Australia for me. Australia, core of my heart, my country. The ceremony will now continue with the arrival of the Australian Defence Force Catafalque Party. Please be upstanding.
Please be seated. As we await 9.58, please spend a moment in quiet reflection and remember the sacrifice of the fallen. Please prepare for the sudden loud noise of the siren, aircraft and gunfire.
to make the welcome address, I now call upon the Right Worshipful, the Lord Mayor of the City of Darwin, the Honourable Convert Scarless. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, boys and girls, welcome to the commemorative service of the 79th anniversary of the bombing of Darwin. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Larakia people, and pay my respects to the Larakia elders, past and present. Today is a day to pause and reflect on our history, how it has shaped our present, and the significance it holds in our future. Darwin has an especially unique military past of national significance. This site where we are today is the only commemorative site in Australia from which a battle was fought in defence of our country. This is the place where the war came to Australia. The importance of this site and the attack that took place in Darwin are becoming increasingly recognised in our national psyche, and the recent addition of the eternal flame to this important Senate of precinct symbolises a perpetual gratitude a remembrance of this occasion. I'd like to extend a especially warm welcome to veteran Mervyn I and his families. Mervyn was here in 1942. He was based in Nightcliff when, just before 10 a.m., a sky full of planes came in view across the horizon. That day was a typical hot and humid February day, just like today, when the air raid sirens first began to ring out across the city. Mervyn and other young Australian and American soldiers, sailors and airmen were at the forefront of the unfolding carnage as 188 enemy aircrafts began dropping bombs on Darwin Harbour. The reality is that Darwin was completely exposed and the few anti-aircraft guns scattered around were unable to cope with such a high-scale aerial attack. More than 230 people of our people died in the first raids, civilians as well as servicemen. Of the 55 ships in Darwin Harbour, 11 were sunk and 15 were damaged, resulting in a devastating loss of life in the harbour waters that you see today looking so calm behind me. Darwin Harbour's waters of remembrance remain the resting place of many Australian and United States servicemen. Many Darwin families also experienced tragic loss as those going about their daily work were killed, the postmaster's family, the young telegraphist and the local wharfies. Many more raids were to fall over the next 21 months, but the rest of Australia was unaware at the time of these events. Darwin then, as today, was a multicultural town and the war did not discriminate every community member was deeply affected. Since 2011, the bombing of Darwin commemoration has become a national day of observance. It is a time not only to reflect, but to learn and tell the stories of our veterans to younger generations. It's so wonderful to see so many school children here today on this significant anniversary. Future generations need to learn the horror of war to ensure that they understand the importance of preserving peace. Generations of children born here have been able to grow without ever experiencing war and the senseless loss of life which accompanies it. Generations raised in peaceful time are society's most powerful advocates for peaceful future. Modern Darwin is a vibrancy that has rebuilt on two occasions. It creates opportunities and choices for all who join our community. It has a long and proud defence presence as part of the wonderful mix of people who make up the Darwin community. And we're privileged to have some of these veterans here with us today who endure the tragedy of war. And I'd like to conclude my speech by reciting some words, words spoken in the other side of the world, words that are engraved in a monument in Thermopylae, the place that Leonidas and his 300 gave their life to defend their motherland. I'll recite these words first in ancient Greek, and then I'll translate in English. Oxynagelin like a demonies, otiti de kimetha, tiskin on rimasi pithomeni. O oh, stranger, you pass from this place. Tell the rest of our people in Australia that we have died here, faithfully obeyed the orders of our country, lest we forget. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It is now my pleasure to introduce Her Honour, the Honourable Vicky O'Halloran, Administrator of the Northern Territory to present a reflection. Distinguished guests, veterans, active service personnel, family and friends, good morning. I am honoured to stand with you this morning here at the Darwin Cenotaph 
a monument now in its 100th year, providing a place for Territorians and visitors to pay their respects and commemorate the lives of those who have served our country. I acknowledge the traditional owners, protectors and keepers of the lands and waters that surround us here this morning, the Larrakia people. I pay my utmost respect to Larrakia elders past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to all Aboriginal servicemen and women who have and continue to serve in the line of duty. I would also like to make a special welcome to our new defence families who have recently relocated to Darwin and who join us for the first time as we reflect on the events that occurred here on this day 79 years ago. On the acts of war that shaped our city, our community and our spirit, making it the remarkable place that it is today. Like the servicemen and women and their families stationed here in Darwin on the 19th of February 1942, you are now embedded in our rich and decorated defence history, a history of which we are incredibly proud. When I was first appointed your administrator in 2017, I was invited to attend a tour and briefing at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. During this visit, I cited many of the original artefacts salvaged from the aftermath of air raids and warfare that decimated Darwin during World War II. One of the items of particular interest to me was the Australian flag that was flying proudly on the lawns of Government House nearly eight decades ago on a morning that was no doubt not too dissimilar to this one where the administrator of the day, Mr Charles Lydiard, Aubrey Abbott, and the staff of Government House were going about their daily duties when they heard the direful sounds of sirens piercing through the air, followed only moments later by the roar of planes overhead. The administrator and his family, along with the Government House staff, ran across the lawns where the flag was flying to an underground shelter located beneath the administrator's offices, where the garages are today. Former Administrator Abbott recorded this account of the event in his diary, writing, The entire office structure seemed to rise in the air. The concrete floor above us lifted and the reinforced pillars snapped like dry sticks. Then it settled down amid the crash and rumble of falling masonry and grey dust. The bomb obliterated half of the office, making a crater 20 feet deep and 30 feet wide. These were the moments when Australia and our national flag were attacked on home soil for the first time. The Australian flag flying at Government House that morning became a focal point for the fighter pilots who attacked it repeatedly each time they flew over in the hope of bringing it down. Eventually, all that remained of the largest white Commonwealth star was the outline. Symbolic of the strength of spirit of the Darwin community, the flag continued to fly despite the battering and when the dust settled, Mr Abbott salvaged the flag to ensure it would not fall. And that, like the community of the day, resilient and determined, it would proudly rise again. This year marks the 100th anniversary of our Royal Australian Air Force, and I am proud to be an honorary Air Commodore of No. 13 Squadron. Number 13 Squadron, stationed here in 1942, suffered greatly during the first two raids on the 19th of February, with their unit attacked and vital stores destroyed. Yet, against overwhelming odds, the squadron continued to make a significant impact on the war effort. They conducted vital reconnaissance and search missions, successfully striking and sinking two enemy vessels and damaging a third off the coast of Timor and the Dutch East Indies. 
In recognition of its wartime contributions, Number 13 Squadron was awarded the United States Presidential Unit Citation, one of only two RAF squadrons to have received this honour. During my time as Administrator, I have had the great privilege of spending significant time with our defence personnel right across the Northern Territory, with Norforce personnel in Alice Springs, Batchelor and Nullanboy, at RAF headquarters in Tyndall and at our Larrakia and Robertson Barracks here in the Top End. I have seen firsthand the high-level technical expertise used in securing our extensive borders while surveying our coast with our Navy and with the Maritime Border Command. What has been particularly noticeable to me in each of these encounters is the clear and fundamental commitment to serving our country and protecting our Australian values and way of life. We are fortunate to live in a country with an eminently experienced, dedicated and highly skilled defence force who through rigorous training have the expertise to support and defend us in times of crisis. While we remember the horrendous acts of war that occurred on this day in 1942, killing more than 200 civilians and service personnel, let us also reflect on the continuing crucial contribution of the people of our ADF. These remarkable Australians fought then, as they continue to fight now, for our ongoing safety, our freedoms and our way of life. To all our pilots, our soldiers, seamen, submariners, reservists, instructors, medical staff, cadets and officers, our heartfelt thanks. You truly do serve us all. And to the mates, the colleagues and the cobbers who made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty, you will not be forgotten, nor have you died in vain. Go well, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Your Honour. I would now like to introduce the Honourable Michael Gunner, Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, to present a commemorative address. I acknowledge the Larrakia, who stood strong during the defence of Darwin, rendering invaluable service to the nation as guardians and protectors of this, our northern coast. The Larrakia and those of other First Nations tribes did not receive their proper dues at the time, but their stories have become much better understood. From Darwin to Dubrook and beyond, Aboriginal servicemen did us all proud. Ladies and gentlemen, if you sometimes think that governments have a tendency to rush to appoint inquiries or royal commissions, then I want to assure you this. It is not a modern day phenomenon. The bombing of Darwin on this day 79 years ago prompted a swift response from the Commonwealth. On March 3, 1942, Justice Charles Lowe, a Victorian Supreme Court judge, was appointed to conduct a commission of inquiry into February 19. Justice Lowe acted with speed and in the early hours of the following morning, March 4, just two weeks after the bombing, he was on a plane to Darwin to begin his inquiry. He quickly gained great personal insights. Darwin's RAF airfield was bombed at 2pm on the day of his arrival. The purpose of Justice Lowe's inquiry was to report on the damage sustained, the number of casualties, the degree of cooperation between the armed services, the steps taken to defend the town, whether military and civilian commanders failed to discharge their responsibilities, and the level of preparedness of military and civil authorities. However, something quite critical was missing from his terms of reference. That is, what steps had the Commonwealth Government taken to ensure the town of Darwin was properly protected in the first place? 
Certainly, it was fair to ask whether the military leaders in Darwin had done enough. However, they could only work with the tools they were given. And those tools, those very few tools, were given to them by the Commonwealth. Darwin was desperately underprepared for what occurred on February 19. Justice Lowe, however, would not need to level any criticism at the Commonwealth in his report because it was conveniently exempted from his line of inquiry. Of course, we know that even before this, the first attack on Australian soil, our service people were already stretched in places near and far. We were in France and Italy, the Mediterranean and North Africa, and Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Singapore had fallen days before, leading to the horrific enslavement of 15,000 Australian servicemen. But everyone, that is everyone in senior political and military positions, knew that an attack on Darwin was coming. And yet, we had no functioning radar. Our early warning system was what locals could see in the sky with their own eyes. And Japanese observation aircraft were seen flying over Darwin in the days immediately prior to the attacks. An American freighter came under attack on the Wessel Islands of Arnhem Land the day before. A Japanese aircraft carrier was observed in the Flora Sea. These were heavy hints. At that time, a young woman named Betty Page had a job with military intelligence, censoring all mail that left Darwin, cutting out the parts of letters that might have told of boats on the harbour, movement of troops, or really anything that described life in Darwin. Betty Page, later Betty Duke, recalled in a 1992 interview with the NT Archive Service that by the time she finished cutting out the problematic parts of letters, they went back into the envelope looking like paper lace. The authorities took those measures because they knew the threat to Darwin was real. Even so, Betty, who undertook secretarial duties in an office with excellent insights into the coming storm of terror, was not ready for it. No one was. On February 19, she heard the planes and said to her colleague, Oh, isn't it lovely? The Americans are arriving. Then the bombs started falling. Betty, putting on her tin hat, carrying her first aid kit, rushed out to help people who'd been hurt. If you crane your necks just over there, only 200 metres from where we are gathered now, here on the Esplanade, near the old Hotel Darwin site. A bomb fell. Betty was flung, concussed, to the ground. She kept helping the injured, not realising that she herself was badly wounded by shrapnel. She was taken to hospital, but had to run when it was hit in the second wave. Darwin took a terrible toll that day. And we are entitled to ask, are we any better defended all these years on? I think the answer to that is yes. One of the constants of politics is that our national leaders, who are responsible for our nation's defence, need to strike a balance between spending money on warcraft as a form of insurance against the very real need to satisfy the everyday demands of our population. We, as a people, would surely much rather go about the business of building roads, hospitals and schools ahead of weapons and defences that may never be used. And COVID-19 has shown us we need to dig deep into our nation's cash resources to keep the country moving. And, of course, old enemies are now the closest of friends. And that's particularly evident in Darwin, with Japan being a major trade partner through the Impex LNG project and taking a presence in our skies with joint exercises. But the experience of Darwin 1942 has taught us we can never rely on hope as a deterrence. We now have long-range radar guarding the north. We're about to have a squadron of F-35s in Tyndall. Our Navy is positioning new vessels here. 
We are moving fast into the era of unmanned defences, and our alliances are strong. Sometimes we forget the lessons of history because we think that can never happen again. Here in Darwin, we do not forget, not ever. It's not because we glorify war. It's not because we are on the alert. There is no threat ringing in our ears as we go about our daily business. But we do know that one thing has not changed since 1942. Darwin remains the clearest path to attacking the heart and soul of Australia. That is why we hold close the events of February 19. This day reminds us that Darwin, and indeed the entire north of Australia, plays a critical role in safety and prosperity for this nation. It was true then, it is true now, and it's only by remembering that we can truly say, lest we forget. Thank you, Chief Minister. I would like to invite Chaplain Kelvin Harris to present a prayer for the Australian Defence Force. It is now a time to lift our minds and our hearts in prayer and thanks for those who have given their lives and those in our Defence Force who are still willing to give their lives in our defence. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you for the service and sacrifice of all who have made possible the freedom we enjoy and the heritage we have been given. We commend to you all who now serve in the defence force of our nation. Shelter them when in danger, and in time of peace, keep them from all evil. For ourselves, we pray that you will help us to persevere in loyalty and courage and grant us to be worthy of those who have gone before us. For Jesus Christ's sake, amen. We now come to the time where we honour and remember those who lost their lives by the laying of wreaths and books. As the wreaths and books are laid, Music will be performed by the band of the 1st Brigade. In order to ensure wreath laying is achieved in a respectful but timely manner, those laying wreaths, books, will be invited to do so whilst others are in the process of laying theirs. I now invite Her Honour, the Administrator of the Northern Territory, Vicky O'Halloran and Mr Craig O'Halloran to lay a wreath. I now invite the bombing of Darwin veteran, survivors, evacuees and descendants to lay their wreaths or books.
now invite the Lord Mayor Convert Scarless and the Aldermen of the City of Darwin to lay their wreath. The Honourable Michael Gunner, Chief Minister of the Northern Territory and Ministers of the Northern Territory. Chester, Minister for Veteran Affairs, representing the Honourable Scott Morrison, Prime Minister of Australia, and Liz Cosson, Secretary of Department of Veteran Affairs, representing the Minister for Veteran Affairs and Defence Personnel. Mr Luke Gosling, Member for Solomon, representing the Federal Leader of the Opposition. Speaker of the Legislative Assembly and members of the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly. Judges of the Supreme Court.
Mrs. Leah Finocchiaro, Leader of the Opposition and members of the Opposition Party. Ashley Collingburn, Commander of the 1st Brigade, representing General Angus Campbell, Chief of the Defence Force. Commander Moses Rodino, Commanding Officer, HMAS Kunawara. Wing Commander Andrew Anthony, Senior Australian Defence Force Officer, Royal Australian Air Force, Darwin. Wing Commander Shane Smith, Senior Australian Defence Force Officer, Royal Australian Air Force, Tyndall. States Marine Corps. His Excellency Mark Glauser, High Commissioner of Canada. Mr. Shingo Yamagami, Ambassador of Japan to Australia. Charge d'affaires, US Embassy. <laughs> Mr. Kia Masahiko, the Consul General of Japan. Her Excellency, Ms Innes de Almeida, Ambassador to Australia from the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste. Senators and members of the House of Representatives or their representatives.
mayors of municipalities, regional, shire and community, local government councils and heads of churches and religious organisations. Commissioner of Police, Fire and Emergency Services, Northern Territory Government Department Heads and Federal Government Department Heads, members of the Northern Territory Consular Corps. Representatives of the RSL, National Servicemen's Association and other services and ex-service organisations. Representatives of the Larrakia people. Charles Darwin University and Nursing Museum, Northern Territory, Branch Order of Australia. St John Ambulance, Northern Territory. Australia Post, Northern Territory Red Cross. Australian American Association of the Northern Territory and the Australian Japanese Association of the Northern Territory.
Northern Territory and other schools. Today, the Ode of Remembrance will be read by Rhiannon Miller, a student from Darwin High School. After the recitation of the Ode, the bugler will sound the last post, and there will be a minute's silence to contemplate the sacrifice of the fallen. That silence will be broken with, we will remember them, lest we forget, and the bugler will then sound the rouse. After the playing of the rouse, we will hear one round of fire, and in doing so, memorialise the 79th anniversary of the bombing of Darwin Day. Please prepare for sudden loud gunfire. Please stand for the Ode of Remembrance. They went with, they went with songs to battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end, against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. 
Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them, lest we forget. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, please remain standing for the Australian National Anthem to be led by the Band of the First Brigade, Shalom Kar and the Darwin Choral.
please remain standing for the benediction and departure of the Catafalque party. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted and honour all people. Love and serve God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you, those you love, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In closing, I would like to say a special thank you to the survivors, descendants and evacuees who are here today and most importantly our surviving veteran Mervyn I. This commemoration is very much about remembering what happened in Darwin and having you here with us from across Australia is truly an honour. Prior to concluding the ceremony, I thank all those who have contributed to organising this very special event and in particular the Australian Defence Force, the Northern Territory Government, Band of the 1st Brigade, Shalom Carr and Darwin Corral, Greg Hardy, Nick Belfield, Viva Energy Australia, Kyriakos Lambrinidis and Rhiannon Miller from Darwin High School and the City of Darwin staff. Would you now please be upstanding for the playing of the musical salute and departure of Her Honour, the Administrator of the Northern Territory. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, today's Bombing of Darwin Day commemorative service is now finished. On behalf of the Lord Mayor of Darwin, Convet Scarlis, the Alderman of the City of Darwin, I thank you for your presence here today. Thank you and good morning. <laughs>